Napoleon's central army, including Davout's corps, now numbered around 200,000 men, compared to the 125,000 of the first and second Russian armies. Not counting the units that had been detached for garrisons and flank guards, the French had already lost around 100,000 to disease, fatigue and desertion. But this was far less than what de Tolly expected, and in fact the Russians had largely lost the Davina dnieper line, which their initial strategy hinged on. For his part, Napoleon was surely disappointed in the failure of his maneuvers, the quality of his soldiers and generals, and perhaps his inability to personally manage such a tremendous operation. But one thing the Emperor could hardly blame was his supply system, which had largely preserved an army that, in terms of numbers and condition, now posed a far greater threat to Moscow than the Swedes of Charles XII. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of non-fiction movies and shows from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. CuriosityStream has millions of subscribers and new shows every week on history, science, tech, military history, and more. I recently watched The Combat Obscura about a young man who enlisted in the Marine Corps and served as combat camera in Afghanistan. His documentary is what the Corps does not want you to see, a look at the daily life in a war zone told by the Marines themselves. And as our viewer, you get a special discount on CuriosityStream. Click the link below to visit curiositystream.com slash historymarsh for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series, and use the code HISTORYMARSH when you sign up to get a 25% discount comes out to only $15 a year. That's just $1.25 per month, much cheaper than other streaming services. Stay curious with Curiosity Stream. On the Russian side, first and second armies finally joined at Smolensk, historically the western gateway to Moscow. But criticism of de Tolly was mounting, most notably from Bagration himself, who complained directly to Tsar Alexander. Realizing that de Tolly's withdrawals were undermining his political credibility, the Tsar now reversed course and demanded aggression against Napoleon. By mid-August, de Tolly dutifully began seeking battle outside the city, though his unenthusiasm was evident through his cautious, halting movements. He was right to be careful. Once Napoleon learnt of the Russian advance, he immediately prepared another maneuver to trap the Russian armies. Gathering his 200,000 men, the Emperor planned to lure de Tolly back to Vitebsk, while his force would wheel around, capture Smolensk, and block the Russians from withdrawing to Moscow. Things started off promisingly, with the Grand Armée achieving operational surprise as it swept up the Smolensk road. But then the French cavalry vanguard met a detachment from Second Army, and it all fell apart. Repeated and wasteful charges failed to destroy the Russians, who ran back to Smolensk and raised the alarm. Having failed to supervise the action again, the Emperor also failed to treat the Russian alarm with appropriate urgency. As a result, by the time the French reached Smolensk, the Russian armies were also there and had installed a strong garrison inside. Foiled, a frustrated Napoleon decided to force his decisive battle by assaulting Smolensk directly and bloodily. De Tolly refused to take the bait and ordered another withdrawal from Smolensk, prompting furious accusations of cowardice and treason. Bagration, in particular, stormed off with Second Army accidentally re-separating himself from first, right before Napoleon's eyes. Very luckily for the Russians, those eyes were closed as the Emperor was asleep, and the local French corps failed to show initiative by moving into the space. By the time the French realized the lost opportunity, it had passed them by, alongside First Army. Napoleon now had to make a decision. Moscow was next after Smolensk, and the Russians would surely defend it in battle. 
but there were only two months left in the regular campaign season, and one would be spent marching to and from the city alone. Alternatively, the French could halt at Smolensk, reorganize themselves and wait until mid-1813 to lunge at Russia's spiritual capital. The first option was a big risk, but the rewards were potentially decisive. Napoleon would be battling against a confused and demoralized enemy, instead of a refreshed and reinforced one, in 1813. Forcing a decision now would also prevent a Russian winter offensive, like in 1807. And moreover, 1807 also showed that even a half-complete victory could get the weak Tsar to accept terms. And so, not for the first nor last time, Napoleon decided that risky action was the way, and in late August, set out for Moscow with 150,000 troops. The Tsar was also making a decision. The virulent criticism against Atoli after Smolensk made it impossible to keep him in command. The Tsar needed somebody whose popularity, seniority and ethnicity made him beyond question. There was really only one person who was fit, and so in mid-August, Kutuzov was appointed as commander-in-chief of the combined Russian force, now 150,000 strong. Confusingly, Tatoli and Bagration still kept command over their respective armies. Just as Napoleon foresaw, Moscow was too important for Kutuzov not to offer a fight. Heavy rains and mud almost cancelled the French advance, but by September, the Grande Armée was before Borodino, where the Russians waited behind hastily built defences. With little time left for manoeuvre, Napoleon again launched a frontal assault on September the 8th, largely destroying Second Army and forcing First to withdraw. A greater victory might have been won had the elite guards been thrown into the fray, but by then the Emperor had already made his point. The Russians could no longer realistically defend Moscow. In any case, with a third of his army consumed by Borodino, Napoleon needed to keep the guard fresh to repel any new attacks. Within a week, the French were at Moscow. There was nothing Kutuzov could do, save hold a conference where all the generals, except the mortally wounded Bagration, agreed to bear collective responsibility for abandoning the city. The Russians headed south, eventually settling at the fortified camp of Tarutino to wait for winter. 100,000 French marched into a half-empty Moscow on September the 14th. Napoleon had hoped to make use of local officials, but they had all left alongside Kutuzov. There was therefore little attempt to organize the many supplies still left in the city, even after the great fire that raged in the following days. In any case, having reached the operational objective of his entire campaign, Napoleon sunk into strategic complacency, fully believing that peace was imminent and withdrawal preparation would only delay Alexander's response. The response was actually already occurring in the form of partisan warfare. Rather than the standard picture of a people's guerrilla war, partisan in 1812 meant small-scale military raids supported by local guides or militia. Russian Cossacks in particular roamed around Moscow and the road to Smolensk, killing French foragers and reducing the French supply flow to a trickle. Nevertheless, the French infantry were fine in Moscow. It was the horses who starved in great numbers. Within a month, only 15% of the cavalry mounts were still alive, and the draft animals for the artillery and baggage weren't faring any better. Sensing major trouble, Napoleon actually pled for peace, sacrificing any hope of bending Russia to his will. The Tsar again did not respond. Instead, the Russians now mounted conventional attacks on the French, raising the specter of the dreaded winter offensive. On October 19th, Napoleon finally acknowledged that no peace was forthcoming, and he needed to make for Smolensk and perhaps try again in 1813. The French left Moscow with 95,000 men. The Russian attacks were the first step in their planned winter offensive along the entire front. The general idea 
was for the flank armies to drive their French counterparts away from Napoleon, then help the advancing Kutuzov encircle the Emperor. Kutuzov's reinforced force now was actually larger than Napoleon's at 100,000. He had also ejected de Tolly and consolidated control over his command. Nevertheless, Kutuzov remained skeptical about his chances in battle. Some of the new militiamen did not even have muskets, and furthermore, his own supply was not particularly reliable. The prospect of confronting Napoleon's guard in sparse Belarus did not appeal to him at all. As Napoleon marched south on an alternative road back to Smolensk, Kutuzov tested his thesis by sending a corps to block the French at Maloyaroslavets. The Russians were shunted aside, confirming Kutuzov's fears that the French were still powerful. But Napoleon was also spooked by the Russian move. With most of his cavalry gone, he could not risk blindly marching into unfamiliar territory where Kutuzov could possibly outmaneuver him. So the Emperor decided to make for Smolensk using his original route. The Grand Armée began to march at an intense pace. Soldiers who couldn't keep up simply fell out of the ranks, becoming victims to exposure or to the Cossacks. Soon, entire formations were dissolving into crowds of stragglers, any semblance of discipline destroyed amidst the frozen corpses and abandoned baggage. To Napoleon's credit, this pace was indeed too fast for Kutuzov's liking, who cautiously shadowed the French from the south. But his vanguards were allowed to vigorously pursue the French, inflicting more chaos on the remaining formations. By the time the French were back at Smolensk in early November, the army only had 40,000 effectives left. Immediately, the local supply depot was sacked by stragglers and soldiers alike, ruining any attempt by Napoleon to rally his force. He could do little but resume the retreat soon after, with the French running through a Russian artillery gauntlet Kutuzov had set up. Two more obstacles now stood between Napoleon and his next main depot at Minsk. The Dnepr River at Orsha and the Berezina River at Borisov. But by now, the French flanks were steadily falling back under the pressure of Russian reinforcements. The detachments on the north largely stopped the Russians from coming between them and Napoleon. But in the south, the Austrians simply didn't have enough men to hold off the combined forces of Third Army and the Danube Army, and a Russian force of 35,000 broke through and took Minsk in mid-November. Borisov soon followed, and Napoleon was trapped. The Emperor was at Orsha with 50,000 when he heard the devastating news. In despair, he thought of suicidally flinging his troops against the incoming Russians. But then his scouts luckily found a ford north of Borisov. And by feigning a march south, Napoleon successfully misled the Russians for a critical few days. Between November 24th and 26th, Napoleon sacrificed his engineers to build two bridges across the Berezina, then spent another 20,000 troops holding them against the returning Russians. Almost all the stragglers became captives in the process, but Napoleon and his officer cadre were spared the same fate. The harrowing escape wasn't entirely over yet. In fact, only now was the winter at its coldest. But by now the Russians had long since abandoned any serious pursuit, with half of Kutuzov's army out of action due to cold and illness. These were the latest casualties of a campaign that would claim about 150,000 Russian lives. From an original force of 600,000 men total, the Grand Armée was reduced to a mere 100,000, most of these being reservists who had not even entered Russia. Of the 450,000 men of Napoleon's Central Army, only 20,000 would recross the Niemen back into Prussia on December 11th. Napoleon had already left for Paris a week before, with plans to raise a new army for the Wars of 1813. Napoleon had suffered a devastating loss, but not a mortal blow. In 1813, using the officers he had saved at the Berezina, Napoleon raised a new army of 700,000, leading 200,000 of these to fight Prussia and Russia. 
but unlike 1806, this time the Russians started off right next to the Prussian army. Their combined resistance would eventually encourage Austria to join the anti-French coalition, and Napoleon would not just lose his hegemony over Central Europe, but by 1814 his throne as well. Napoleon's Russian campaign saw both France and Russia deploy atypical war strategies. However, Napoleon fared worse under the new circumstances as compared to Alexander. This was partly because Alexander's obstacles to defensive war were merely political, while Napoleon's plan to use pre-industrial methods to supply a long-distance offensive stretched the laws of logistics, though his system held out until Moscow. Behind this was a fundamental strategic miscalculation as to what it would take to bring Russia to heel. A limited or multi-phased war might have delivered better results. In the end, by trying to achieve everything at once, Napoleon set himself on the road to ruin. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as one dollar, or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.